we continue our discussion of Socrates' critique of democracy. No regime is more dear to us than a democracy. No regime was more dear to the Athenians. Nonetheless, Socrates will prove to be a ruthless critic of it. Just to very briefly review, you recall that democracy emerges from the oligarchy. The oligarchy had disenfranchised the majority of its own citizens. The poor, the poor rise up in revolt, easily topple the oligarchs because, after all, the oligarchs were unwilling to invest in a good army. The democracy is established. It has at least four basic qualities. It affirms freedom, privacy, equality, and diversity. Let's focus next on the democratic individual, always the two-part chapter system that Socrates uses to discuss each of the four kinds of unjust regimes. Who is this individual? He is the son of the oligarch. Perhaps uh, to get a picture of the sort of, of story that Socrates is, is telling, let's conjure up a scene. Let's imagine dinner at the oligarch's house. The son is sitting there with the father. The father has only one thing to say over dinner. Don't spend money. Be frugal. All those things that you want, you really shouldn't want. Instead, you should devote yourself to the same pursuit I've devoted myself, namely the pursuit of money. The son, of course, knows that his father is very rich, so there is a basic disc discord or disconnect between what the father is saying and what the father has actually practiced. The father is unwilling to invest in education. His only objective, as we discussed in the previous lecture, is to make more and more money. He is unwilling to invest even in the education of his own son. As a result of this, the son is very undisciplined. He is intoxicated with what Socrates at line 558D calls unnecessary desires. A necessary desire, for example, would be the desire for drink when you're thirsty, the desire for food when you're hungry. We have to act on these desires or we will cease to exist. Unnecessary desires are for things we don't absolutely need. Perhaps you recall the basic transition that was uh, pivotal in book two when we had the transition between the first original city which only met the basic needs of its citizens, but the second city, the city that is sparked by Glaucon's objection, is the city of unnecessary desires. It includes perfume, courtesans, art, and so many other luxuries. That's very much echoed in this section of the Republic. The son of the oligarch, the rich, stingy old man, is wild at heart because he has been deprived of every sort of pleasure even though his father could provide it because his father is so rich. So what does this kid do after dinner? He goes out into, t into the city, out onto the streets, and there he is exposed to all sorts of chaos, all kinds of desires, all kinds of pleasures, and he becomes enthralled by them. This is the genesis, the coming into being of the democratic individual. Socrates, in lines 561c to d, gives a very elaborate description of this individual. And I would urge you to read that passage very carefully. What you'll find is that, above all else, the democratic individual is whimsical. He has no stable character. Why, we know why he hasn't been properly educated. And in this passage, Socrates describes such a person as sometimes he exercises when he feels like it. Other times he overeats. Sometimes he drinks a lot. Other times he doesn't. Sometimes he participates in politics. For example, if he hears a great speaker, he might become very enthusiastic about that candidate. 
If he hears somebody on the street saying, our country must go to war, perhaps this kid will even join the army. He's very much subject to whims. Sometimes, and this is the remarkable injection in this passage, and I'll, I will return to it near the end of this lecture, sometimes this democratic individual even engages in philosophy. Perhaps the kid bumps into Socrates on the street, gets interested in one of these famous what is it conversations, and for a short time becomes interested in philosophy until, of course, something else captures his fancy and he shifts focus yet again. Above all else, this young person, the democratic individual, is hostile to all forms of authority. We know why. The paramount value of a democracy is the affirmation of freedom. And authority of any form seems to threaten our freedom. I'm reminded of, of a license plate I have often seen, perhaps you have as well, the license plate of New Hampshire. On it, it says, live free or die. I'd rather be dead than, than to submit to authority. This would be the Socratic interpretation of that license plate. What I would suggest to you, and here I'm offering you an interpretation of lines 562E to 563A, is that a democracy becomes what I would call a youth culture. Precisely because it's hostile to authority, it's hostile to traditions. There's no sense of the goodness of being an elder. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. In a democracy where freedom has such overwhelming value, any notion of an elder, a traditional authority, is unwelcome. Socrates gives several examples of this. One of them is, in a democracy, he says, teachers start to fear their students. Students are so rambunctious, they're so undisciplined, they're so hostile to authority that they actually can threaten teachers. If this sounds familiar as a commentary about our own democracy, I think that's a useful thought. Parents in a democracy have a very difficult time disciplining their own children. And if the children are obstinate enough, they may simply give up and say, to heck with it, you go out there, do what you want. Again, all of this derives from the fact that in a democracy, freedom has such enormous value. So let me now raise very explicitly the question whether the democracy Socrates is describing is in fact similar to our own democracy. And I'm going to do this in the hope of provoking you to reflect upon something that's very dear to all of us, our very own political system. We accept it as good, the Socratic, the philosophical demand always, regardless of what your views are, is not to simply accept traditional or conventional wisdom, to challenge it, to think for yourself. This is a very good occasion for us to do that. So I'm going to take a Socratic position myself and, and offer you a criticism of contemporary American society that is parallel to the criticism Socrates offers. I would argue that just as Socrates says, our own democracy has indeed become a youth culture. Obvious examples of this. Think of our, fa our sense of fashion. Young, the, the image of a young person is so utterly dominant in our media. Everyone wants to look young. They want to look thin. They hate the idea of having wrinkles. Right? Nothing is worse than, than looking old, and people in our time are willing to go to extraordinary lengths in terms of surgery, injection of drugs, Anything it takes, nothing could be worse than looking old. Nothing could be worse than being old. In itself, this is perhaps not such a significant phenomenon. However, I think it, in fact, 
is very interesting as confirmation of what Socrates is suggesting is basic to a democracy. There is just such distaste for authority and tradition that there's no reason, no compelling reason, to simply value the old only because they're old. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. I would hesitate to guess how many billions of dollars are spent by the pharmaceutical industry in keeping people looking young. Another example of our own society that confirms Socrates' diagnosis is one I mentioned earlier, the discipline in schools. There are many schools in our country where teachers are quite literally afraid of their own students. There are many schools in this country where students have to walk through a metal detector before they enter to make sure that they don't carry weapons. I work at a university. I don't face that sort of danger, I'm happy to say. But there is something that I do face, which once again is reminiscent of something Socrates, is, Socrates says. Every semester at a university, my students fill out evaluations of the course. And in some universities and some colleges, these evaluations are taken to be critical in determining the value of the professor. Some, in some colleges, a professor will not be rehired if he or she doesn't get good student evaluations. I think if Socrates were to observe this going on in our colleges and universities, he would be utterly appalled. Because what will happen? Well, the teacher will become afraid of the student. Nothing could be worse than offending our students. Nothing could be worse than making the class really hard and perhaps even a bit painful because, after all, the teacher might get bad student evaluations. I once worked in a college where a colleague of mine told me her strategy for getting good student evaluations she said that she would always make sure the day before she was going to distribute the student evaluations, she would serve cookies. Now, this is, I think, a very backwards sense of what the teaching enterprise really is. I'd refer you back to the parable of the cave. One point I emphasized more than once was the fact that this image of our education, and that's what the parable of the cave is said to be, implies a great deal of pain. The prisoner at the bottom of the cave is shackled and must be liberated. This is very painful because the prisoner has been sitting very long. The prisoner must look at the fire. The prisoner eventually must look at the sun. And this is very painful because the prisoner has been in darkness and it will literally hurt their eyes to be exposed to such bright light. I suggested to you in our interpretation of the parable of the cave that what this pain reflects is the difficulty of education. Students have to be pushed hard in order to challenge conventional wisdom, in order to think for themselves. Precisely that notion of hard discipline, Socrates says, is missing in a democracy for all the reasons we've outlined. Let me raise another question. Socrates criticizes democracy for being excessively egalitarian. An egalitarian is someone who believes that human beings are equal. And perhaps you're thinking, well, what in the world could be wrong with that idea? Aren't people equal? Isn't that taken to be a self-evident truth in our own society? Well, to try to elaborate Socrates' critique of excessive egalitarianism, I'll take you back to an earlier issue we discussed. Perhaps you recall the lecture that concerned Socrates' medical ethics. It was a very severe form of medical ethics. Socrates has a basic principle, which is if somebody is wounded, or if an otherwise healthy person gets a cold, yes, they should be treated. But if somebody is chronically ill and has no hope of being restored to a healthy, productive life, they simply should be let go. Now, 
what I would suggest to you is that sort of medical ethics, Socrates's, is not egalitarian. It's making a basic value distinction in kinds of human beings. Some human beings are more valuable than others. Some human beings deserve medical treatment. They deserve the use of our medical resources, but others do not. I gave the example in that lecture of a 90-year-old man who's suffering from Alzheimer's. Socrates would say, and this is shocking, I think, to our ears, Socrates would say, such a person is just not equal to a 30-year-old man who's physically and mentally strong. And if we must take the medical support system away from such a man, in fact, that's a rational decision. To go back to the critique that I would extract from Book 8 of the Republic and apply to contemporary American society, to go back to imitating Socrates, our own system of medicine is a thoroughly egalitarian one. A doctor in a hospital operates with one imperative. Keep the patient alive. Doesn't matter if the patient is a 90-year-old man suffering from Alzheimer's or a 30-year-old man who's otherwise healthy. The objective is always the same. Life and then more life. All life is good. There is no distinction between life and a good life. This was the theme of the earlier lecture concerning medical ethics. That's precisely what Socrates means in Book 8 by excessive egalitarianism. All human beings, he believes, are not equal. Some are worse than others. A very challenging thought, to say the least. I certainly wouldn't encourage you to simply accept it. In fact, the opposite. Challenge it. Think about it. To continue, Socrates believes that democracy is formless. It's chaotic. There is no stable conception that somehow regulates us all and gives us a sense of what is a good life. That is what he means by chaos. There is, in short, too much freedom especially young people, should not be allowed simply to maximize their own options. They should be, to put it very bluntly, told what to do. The Socratic view. So, if we put all of these criticisms together, I think you'll find the heart and soul of the Socratic critique of democracy. It's one of the most famous, in fact, I would think the most famous criticisms of democracy that can be found in the history of Western political philosophy. And it has gotten many, many people angry. But now let me say something that, in fact, is very surprising. And I don't think most readers or scholars pay nearly enough attention to it in their understanding of the republic. Socrates, despite these severe criticisms of democracy that he makes, is actually ambivalent when it comes to democracy. Let me give you two quotes. The first is from 557c. He says, it is probably the fairest, the most beautiful of all regimes. Even more surprisingly, he says the following at 557d. It is probably necessary for the man who wishes to organize a city, as we were just doing, to go to a city under a democracy. That line is surely worth rereading. Because what Socrates, in effect, is saying is that if we want to do what we are right now doing, then maybe we have to be in a democracy. Well, what are we right now doing. We here refers to Socrates and Glaucon and Adamantus, but also us, the readers. What we are right now doing is engaging in philosophy. So Socrates at 557d comes very close to saying 
Perhaps it's only in a democracy that we can practice philosophy. We've had some clues about this possibility in earlier stages of the Republic, and let me remind you what they are. First of all, when I was describing the democratic individual, who I said was whimsical, I mentioned that Socrates says that this person sometimes exercises, sometimes drinks a lot, sometimes engages in philosophy. Now, that engagement with philosophy is very short-lived and not very substantial, but it is nonetheless a mention that the democratic person might engage in philosophy. Another example. I've mentioned that a basic feature of democracy is the protection of privacy. And what this means is there is no obligation, no compulsion to be political. This is quite different. In fact, it's the opposite of what we find in the parable of the cave, where the philosopher has to be returned to the cave, has to be forced back into the cave. In other words, forced to be political. This is mimicked in the very beginning of the Republic. You recall Socrates is on his way home and he's forced, playfully, to stay in the Piraeus. The notion here would be, in a democracy where privacy is guaranteed, a person could pursue philosophy precisely because they don't have to be political. Another point. Again, this is a point I don't think most readers or scholars pay quite enough attention to. I tried to suggest it in my early lectures. Where is the Republic set? It's set in the Piraeus. What was the Piraeus? It was the stronghold of democratic opposition to the tyranny of the Thirty in the years 404 and 403. One of the main characters in Book One of the Republic was Polemarchus. What do we know about him historically? He was executed by the tyrants. He was a democracy fighter. All of these clues lead me to wonder whether, in fact, Socrates' criticism of democracy isn't quite as blunt and hard-edged as it's very often taken to be. I'll put this point in one other way, as a means of summarizing. Perhaps freedom of speech and the protection of privacy are necessary conditions for the possibility of philosophy. Isn't this what we imagine philosophy to be? If you and I are engaged in a philosophical conversation, what we want above all else is to be able to follow that conversation wherever it may lead. We don't want to be hemmed in intellectually at all. We want to be given the chance to talk all night if we want to. If you measure the length of the Republic, it's a very long dialogue. It has 10 books. It's one conversation. These people were apparently talking all night. And where were they talking? In a private home, the home of Cephalus and Polymarchus. I think the setting, again, is meaningful. This conversation that we have been engaged in from the very beginning itself takes place under the conditions available in a democracy. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting to you that Socrates' criticisms of the democracy were not serious. I think he meant each and every one of them. Democracy is excessively egalitarian. There's too much freedom. There's chaos. It's very often a big mess, the notion of formlessness that I introduced. Nonetheless, perhaps what Plato is finally trying to teach us about democracy is a very old lesson that's been echoed for the centuries. As bad as it is, and it is bad, it's the best available. I've already suggested to you, and this was my interpretation 
I warned you of this at the time. I urged you to take my interpretation with a grain of salt. I've suggested that the edifice of the just city, which, if you recall, culminates in the expulsion of every citizen over the age of 10, that comes from the end of Book 7, is meant to be a demonstration that excessive authoritarian justice is actually not desirable. I use the phrase a reductio ad absurdum. I'm not sure at all that Plato is serious about constructing a just city and thinking it to be really the best city that we should all actually aspire to. In other words, I reject what you might call the blueprint theory of Plato's, Repub Re Plato's Republic. The blueprint theory is the notion that what we find in books two through seven is a blueprint for an actual regime which we should aspire to. That is what I'm challenging. That's exactly parallel to what I'm suggesting here about Socrates' criticism of democracy. On the one hand, he means it. On the other hand, it's possible that there are certain hidden virtues in a democracy which he, in fact, is willing to affirm. The primary virtue would be the possibility of philosophy itself. After all, Socrates, the historical figure, lived from 469 to 399. Plato lived from 427 to 354. They lived in Athens. Athens was a democracy. So they flourished. Now, of course, they didn't simply flourish because Socrates was executed in 399. And Plato was undoubtedly overwhelmed by this experience in 399. I think if we put these two ideas together, we come up with this notion that finally Plato is ambivalent about democracy. It has terrible faults, one of them being the fact that the Athenian democracy executed Socrates, but it also allowed for Socrates in the first place. Let me conclude this lecture with what turns out to be the culminating criticism of democracy. And that is, according to Socrates, that a democracy leads to tyranny. And here's why. The democracy is, he says at 502D, drunk with the concept of freedom. As a result of this, the rulers must do what? We've already discussed this. The citizens are so hostile to any form of authority that rulers must flatter the citizens. They must please the citizens in much the same way that a teacher must entertain the students. So the ruler must entertain, please, satisfy the desires of the citizens. As a result of this dynamic, what emerges from a democracy, says Socrates, is the demagogue. The word demagogue comes from the Greek word demos, same as democracy, and the last part of that word means leader. The demagogue is the leader of the people. He is the supreme flatterer. He is the ultimate populist. He, he captivates the imagination of the majority of the citizens and becomes first among equals. Eventually, this person becomes a tyrant, and as we will find in the next lecture, there is no regime worse than the tyranny.